All right, so statistical graphs. So we're going to learn about a few different types, and we're, we're going to tackle them by hand, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll get some technology involved. Some of them are easier than others, um, but the concepts behind them will never be really difficult. It's just physically producing the graph, like the amount of writing and drawing that you have to do in order to get the graph. That's, that's what makes one more challenging than another, right? Um, something to bear in mind, this data set, uh, because of spacing issues, this is one set of raw data. It's not a frequency table, right? So the, the second line is a continuation of the first line, right? So what we're gonna do first is create a frequency histogram. I did hit record, look at that. So uh, we're gonna create a frequency histogram based off of this information. And so what we wanna do, just thinking back to the last time we saw uh, an example of a frequency table, we didn't do anything with it, but we, we saw what they look like. Uh, they're generally intervals of values and the corresponding frequencies. So that's how I'm gonna label this. I'm gonna say interval. Also known as a class. So it's the same as class and then the corresponding frequency. So once you have that information, then you're able to create the, the, the table, which in turn allows you to create the graph, but coming up with that information is the key, right? So what we want to do is identify the lowest value and the highest value, and then come up with even intervals getting us from the lowest to highest value. So intervals of uh, consistent width. So if I decide, for example, I wanna do my first interval as zero to nine, then the second one should be 10 to 19, then 20 to 29 and so on, right? Always having the same length of the interval. But if I decide I wanna do something like zero to 19, then the next one should be 20 to 39 and so on. Um, I could also do from zero to 100 and just put everything all in one, in one uh, category. But the issue with that is it doesn't tell you anything about the distribution. So it kind of, uh, it's cheating and not really serving much of a purpose. Uh, not cheating in an academic sense. It's just like, it's like cheating when you don't do the extra reps when you're at the gym, you're cheating yourself, you know? So, um, so there's that, and then yeah, I suppose, I mean, it's, it would be pretty sizable. You could list the values from zero to 100 and then put corresponding frequencies, but that's gonna take up a lot of space. So what I do is I just kinda, kinda split the difference and come up with what I think are reasonable frequency, uh, reasonable intervals, like zero to 24. I break it up into quarters, because I'm going to 100. So the next one would be 25 to 49, then 50 to 74, then 75 to 99. But then you get that weird one at the end where it's like 100 to 124, okay. Um, I got that whole interval just to account for the 100s. But yeah, if we're going to be consistent, you have to have an even width to each of your intervals, right? And, and you can quickly and easily verify it because you can see going from 0 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and 75 to 100 is plus 25 every step of the way. And it's the same thing on the high side. Right, so it's consistent across the board. That's one quick way of checking to make sure your intervals are, are the way they ought to be, right? And then- the question, if you have a bigger data set, and is there any like mathematical rules that would say an interval it should be X length or like, is there something about how you would, or is it more just what you think would work for the data? Most of the time it's what you think, but if you have a large data set, normally you just divide the length of that data set. So if there's like a thousand values, you divide it by how wide you want each interval to be. Mm -hmm. And then that tells you how many intervals you would have. And then that gives you a, a, a basis of how you would uh, designate everything. So that, that's really the only way to, 
to to do it because i've had people that would say all right uh zero to 49 50 to 99 and then 100 to 149 i'd be like okay i mean that's technically right you, i don't know what you're learning from that but um you know i i always have it in my mind that i want to have the intervals be small enough that i can see minute fluctuations in the data but large enough that I'm not going to spend the rest of my life creating the graph. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for that balance. Okay. Uh, but then once you have your intervals, it's just a matter of going through the list and saying, okay, well, what falls in what category? So I'm just looking for anything that falls in the zero to 24. Looks like I have just those two values. Go with that color uh 25 to 49 so that would be this interval here uh, i got my 25 and i got the 42 and i think that might be it on that end so just two there fifty to seventy four we should get a bunch more here so fifty to seventy four i got fifty one <clears throat> 55, 56, well, maybe not a bunch, just three. Seventy-five to ninety-nine. So this this is where we're gonna get most of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and eleven. And there's 20 values, so I'll know in a second if I missed any. And then the last one is just the uh, the 100s because I don't have anything bigger than 100. So there's just two of them. Um, what some people will do just to make it look a little nicer, because that that 100 to 124, believe it or not, well maybe maybe you will believe it because maybe this is how you're feeling. It really bothers people. They look at that 100 to 124. They're like, that's a lot of extra interval for nothing there. So what a lot of people will do, and I'm going to replace what I had there in a second. They'll write this 100 plus, you know, it's the 100 category. So there's a little bit more. That's perfectly fine if that makes you feel better. But I'm just going to leave it like that because I like the consistency of it. Okay. So we can make a graph out of that. And, you know, the, the hard part is kind of already done in terms of the thinking. We just got to physically produce a graph. And so there, there's, there's pros and cons to everything. So that's what we're going to do here. I got five intervals. And so what I need are five even increments. And I want to try to use as much of the graph as possible. I don't have to use it all, but I want to, I want to get a good chunk of it because I got all this space available, so I might as well make use of it. We want to keep relatively even spacing. If it's a little off, that's okay. You don't have to measure. The intervals go on the horizontal axis and the frequencies go on the vertical axis. So I'm going to just kind of do it off on the side here. The, the interval itself is the gap in between tick marks. So I have this interval is the 0 to 24. This interval is the 25 to 49. 50 to 74. 75 to 99. And then the 100 to 124. All right. We label this one intervals. Or interval is fine. If it has a particular name, like grades on a test or shoe sizes or something like that, then you could label it with whatever it is in particular. But you could also just leave it as intervals. I'm fine with that. Right. Uh, for the frequencies, the highest one I have is 11. <clears throat> so there's no reason why I can't just go by ones.
And so you can write the word frequency or you could just use the letter F. It's a universally understood abbreviation. I'm going to write a frequency. Okay. So we have an appropriately labeled graph. You'll notice I didn't put any numbers on the vertical axis, uh, axis, and that's because any unlabeled tick marks are assumed to be default values of one. So it's only when I want to change the scheme, if I want to go by twos or threes or something like that, that's when I would need to label something, right? But not the case here. So my values are two, two, three, 11, and two. So I'm going to go up to a height of two. Twice. And a height of three. I'm going to have to use the line draw tool for this one because it's a disaster waiting to happen. Move it over a little bit. You do get a sense of what a straight line looks like when I do it before it auto corrects. So Unfortunately, I'm not handing that up. That's that's what it is. It sucks. I can't even blame it on the stylus. It's just it's the way my nerve damage has taken effect. All right. But anyway, so my drawing is definitely crappier than some of yours, and it's at the same time better than some of yours. Depends on who you are. So some of you uh, make like gorgeous works of art out of these things. And some of you uh, just kind of, I mean, chicken scratch is like a, a generous name for what you produce, right? Um, abomination, uh, just, just dreadful, you know? Um, I gotta say though, and I don't know why this happens, no matter what kind of data set I select, no matter what intervals I always select, my histograms always end up looking like the middle finger. I have no idea why. It just always, it looks like I did that on purpose. I promise I'm not flipping you off. But if your graph looks like a god awful abomination, that's fine. As long as the numerical parts of it are, are, are precise. Right, so I'm looking at the table as overriding the graph. Right, so I look at the quality of the graph. Maybe I look at the, your second bar. I'm like, I can't tell. Is that like two or one or whatever? If you're ever in doubt, just put the number inside the box. And by in doubt, I mean like in doubt as to whether or not I'll understand what you what you drew. Just put the numbers in the box. It takes all the guesswork out. And this way if you drew something accidentally that went to a height of 10 when it should have gone to a height of 11, the number overrides the height, right? So you, you get the benefit of the doubt there and you still get full credit. And it's just a little, little something. And that, that's all, that's definitely born from the fact that I, I just can't draw. So I just expect that nobody else can either. And I, uh, I, I give all these different avenues to still get full credit while also producing uh, just, just terrible works of art. Um, yeah, th there's no way this would even look half as good, uh, and like one sixteenth as good as what is it, as what it does. If I didn't have the autocorrect features on here, it's just a nightmare. Right. So, <clears throat> so that's a frequency, uh, frequency histogram, frequency table, frequency histogram. But now we're going to talk about the cumulative frequency histogram, frequency table. Uh, that's actually not too bad. I'm just going to abbreviate the cumulative intervals and cumulative frequencies. A uh, little caveat there, though, is that it's only not too bad because we already created a frequency table. You know, if we had to create from a raw set of data, just one graph, and that graph was a cumulative frequency histogram. You'd have to do everything that we just did for a frequency table, and then build off of that to create the cumulative frequency table, right? So it's, uh, it's not as easy as I'm, as I'm making it seem because there's, there's work that you wouldn't uh, 
necessarily realize that you had to do, right? Until, until push comes to shove and you have to do it, All right? So we need cumulative intervals and we need to accumulate uh, frequencies also. So what we're gonna actually do is just that. We're gonna actually accumulate intervals. So from lowest to highest. So I'm gonna look at these and trying to think the best way because I wrote it and I want to let me get rid of these. Oh. Oh. That guy, I can just grab. All right, so now I'm going to do this. Copy, and then I can just bring this stuff back. Now. All right. So these are the intervals I have to work with. So I'm just gonna find a place where I can chuck them. I'm just gonna pop them over there. All right, so these are the intervals I have. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start working with them uh, one at a time, then two at a time, then three at a time. So the first interval, zero to 24, I could put that right in. All right, because if I'm working from the lowest interval, as in numerically the lowest, to the highest interval, naturally I'd start with a zero to 24, right? So my second interval is going to be a collection of the first two intervals, all right? So if I were to take the first two intervals and put them together, all right, so accumulate being the operative term. All right, so I already have the first interval. Now I want to, along with the first interval, I want to now gain the second interval. What that would give me is a brand new interval. If I just kind of cut out the middleman, literally, I would go instead of zero to 24, then 25 to 49, I would say, well, why not just go directly from zero to 49? So that would be my second cumulative interval. So a cumulative interview in, interval is one that adds up the intervals before it? Correct. Cool, thanks. No problem. Oh, that's not a rectangle. I mean, I could have lived with it, but it's, I want it to look nice. All right, so then, the first three intervals together. So I'm gaining now the third interval of 50 to 74. That's gonna help me come up with my third interval. And again, I'm cutting out the middleman here. Zero to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 74. Why not just go from zero directly to 74? All right. So then we would gain the fourth interval. along with the first three intervals, gets us from zero to 99. And then when you see what's really happening, you're like, well, I don't really have to do any of this. It's just for note taking purposes. You start understanding that all you're doing is taking all the intervals that we came up with from the frequency distribution and just replacing the lower bound with a, uh, a zero instead of whatever it was originally. All right, so you just do a quick compare and contrast. You look at the intervals and compared to the cumulative intervals and you see that they're the same upper bounds, but the lower bound is always zero. Now, 
it won't always, always be zero. It's just always zero because the lowest number in this data set is zero, right? The lowest interval starts with the number zero. The lowest interval started with a 10, it would be 10 to whatever, right? So then what we have to do is following the same general scheme, we have to accumulate frequencies, right? So I'm going to accumulate my first frequency, which is kind of a weird thing to say. You don't really think of accumulating just a single value, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're just accumulating one thing. I can get a rigging rectangle going here. Ah, good enough. So that's where I'm going to get my two. Then I'm going to gain the second interval, which is going to get me up to I have two and another two. It's going to get me up to four. So we're just going to add the next value down the list to get the next entry in my cumulative frequency column. All right. So then let's go green. So two, two, and three is going to get me up to seven. Red again. And we're going to gain 11 more. And then finally, we'll gain the, the last. The last entry, which is going to give me two. That's what my rectangles look like, by the way. Yeah, better. So we're up to, uh, oh, sorry, gaining 11. So I should be up to 18 on the previous one. Sorry, I was more concerned with uh, rectangles and colors and stuff. Kind of lost track of, like, you know, math. All right. And so that last entry should be equal to the total number of values in the data set. So if you get something other than 20, then you know you, you did it wrong, All right? So now I just got to graph this, but the good news is the graph is going to take the same form as what we just did for the frequency histogram. It's just we're going to have zero to 24, zero to 49 and so on along the horizontal axis. And we'll have the cumulative frequencies along the vertical axis, All right? So we're still going to have five intervals. For the cumulative um, frequencies, all you're doing is just adding? Correct. Okay. And so this is the cumulative. And then for the cumulative frequencies, we've got to get up to 20. So at this point, you may want to go like uh, twos or fours or fives or something like that. What I do is I tend to look at the quality of the numbers. So two, four, 18, 20, all even numbers. I'm thinking go by twos. You know, if they were all multiples of four, then I would go by fours, but they're not. All right. So you don't have to label them all. You just got to label the first tick mark. I tend to want to label more just so I don't have to count later on. So I'm going to label them, but if you just want to label the first one, that's fine. So why is one problem so long? Oh, this, this is one of the short ones. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, you know what? That, that's the crazy part about that. That's why we're going to learn how to do this using technology because these are clean data data values. If you look at the numbers, they're like multiples of five. We got zeros, hundreds in there. The real world, numerically, is very very ugly. Numbers in the real world are hideous, and so and 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 there are much more of them, you know. So. They're, they're ugly and there are a lot more of them. Those are two things that I would not want to hear about anything in, in, in life, but uh, specifically when we're, when we're dealing with numbers, it's just very terrifying. And so in those cases, making a frequency table and a histogram by hand is just like, it's a disaster, there's no point. 
So we go to technology for those, but this is like right at the limit of what we can handle by hand, you know, because any, anything that has fewer data, you wouldn't make a graph out of it. If it was only like, let's say five values, what would a graph tell you? Probably nothing, right? So you need an abundance of values in order to want to create a graph, but if you have too many, then you would never want to do it by hand. So we're right at that borderline of what, you know, like what makes sense to do by hand. Yeah. So cumulative frequency. Now, back in my day, we didn't even have the calculators and technology to, to do any of this stuff for us. So when I show you, uh, well, the technology exists, it's just prohibitively expensive. So when I show you how to do this using technology, it'd be like, oh, okay, well, at least there's that, you know, so that's something. We'll get there. Uh, I got to use the line draw tool. This is terrible. Two, four, seven, I'm going to ballpark. 18. Just gonna wing it. Oh, look at that awful nonsense. Oof. You know what? Just gonna live with it. See if I can maybe move this over a smidge. Kinda. Then I'll just do a little. Flatten that out, clean it up, you know, blur the lines a little bit. Make it nicer by making it look uglier. All right, uh, well, there's no reasonable expectation that anybody would be able to determine what these heights are, except for that first one, that seems clearly to be a two, but I'm gonna chuck the numbers in just to be safe. 7, 18, and 20. And so that's the frequency, uh, cumulative frequency histogram. And with cumulative frequency histograms, you can expect that they'll always either increase in height or remain the same. They'll never decrease in height. And that's because frequencies can never be negative. And so there's no mechanism that allows for the heights to decrease as we accumulate intervals, right? So, because they're specifically, specifically counts right so that that's part of it so there's a little bit of the expectation that okay i know i did it right because aside from labels i have my last entry is 20 and that's the total number of values in the set and it was always increasing in height so i'm feeling pretty good about this all right so i'm gonna pause all right so though i mean these are the most popular uh, types of graphs in terms of like what you would normally see in a in an article or uh, in some kind of periodical when, when you look at a data analysis most of the time you see like a bar graph or a frequency histogram or something along those lines but it's not always the most appropriate when you're creating a statistical display and so that brings us to another type of graph known as a box plot now this is going to be your favorite type of graph you just don't realize it yet uh and that that's okay um it's your favorite type of graph because there's overlap between this concept and some other concepts that we uh, talked about like uh, outliers uh it, the, the primary makeup of a box plot is known as a five number summary that five number summary and i can just jot that down here Five number summary very creative name it's a summary it's summary statistics that consists of five numbers so it's like okay uh, nothing more clever than that you have the minimum value you have the lower quartile we've discussed this before that's the same as saying q1 the median The upper quartile, we know that that's Q3, and the maximum value. When I say the maximum value and the minimum value, I'm talking about the highest and lowest value in the data set. All right, so 
those are usually pretty easy to pick out visually. We know that the smallest number is zero and the highest number is 100. We just got to figure out all the other values. With the idea being that we're not, we're not going to do that by hand, we're going to use technology. Technology. Oh, look at this. When I hit stats before, it displayed a minimum, a Q1, a median, a Q3, and a max. Oh, look at that. It was giving us the five number summary the whole time, the whole time. So that's telling me that I already have the tools necessary to come up with the information that I need in order to create this graph. That's another reason to like it. You already know how to come up with the numbers, right? Um, and I'll get into the reasons, the statistical reasons, aside from just convenience, the statistical reasons for why you should like uh, the box plot. It, uh, it's kind of like an adjustment because people, they, they gravitate naturally towards the things that they're more familiar with, even if those things that they're more familiar with are more complicated. It just, this is what works for me. So this is what I'm going to do. I don't want to do it that way because I, I know how to do it this other way. And there's merit. There's definitely merit to that. But if the, the method that you're accustomed to using or the method that you just really want to use isn't appropriate for a particular situation, then it's all over. Okay? So that's what, kind of what we run up against when we're dealing with statistical graphs. Sometimes a graph is just not appropriate for a data set. So if I'm talking about percentages, you know, like if I'm doing a poll and I want to know how many people are going to vote for candidate A, how many people are going to vote for candidate B, and how many people are going to, you know, not vote at all, those are counts. Why would I take an average? You know, I would just want, if I'm going to display that information, I'd probably just make a pie chart, you know, or maybe a bar chart. But if I'm talking about uh, blood pressure, uh, recorded blood pressure over time, which I, which I actually had to do, you know, so uh, when, when I was uh, kind of discovering uh, proper dosage for uh, my hypertension medicine, it, it, it was a matter of like, okay, take your blood pressure uh, X number of times a day, record the information. And my doctor just wanted me to send it to her and she would, she would figure everything out. But, you know, like math so what am I going to do I've got all this data so I can make a word problem out of it you know so you know I'm sitting in, in my stat class that semester and we're, we're running the numbers and we're just figuring out what you know like what my situation is going to boil down to and you know like the, there's a lot of in, a lot of moving parts there a lot of lurking variables but one thing that you get out of that is like well what's more appropriate to talk about the mean median or mode when we're talking about the average value you know, so like the central number, should I be talking about the mean? You know, like, well, that's really sensitive to outliers. So if there's one day where my blood pressure spiked, that would pull up the average and maybe give a misleading number. What about the median? That's the middle of the road value. I don't know, maybe I wanna go with that, but then I, I settled on the mode and said, you know, I want the one that occurs most frequently, you know? So, and now it wasn't exact, you know, sometimes it was like 127 over 87. Sometimes it was 128 over 88. You know, it's in that neighborhood, but I, I can kind of consolidate that information into one group. You know, so that, that's part of it. But, you know, like you got to be thinking about like under what circumstances would it be appropriate to use one form of graphical display as opposed to another. And so sometimes the only way to figure that out is to make the graph, take a look at it and say, okay, well, what does this tell me? I don't think it tells me anything. Okay, so let's try a different graph. You know, that, sometimes that's the answer. Now, if you have to create a graph by hand only to find out it wasn't the right kind of graph, that's gonna aggravate you. That's why we get technology involved, technology. So, long story short, too late. Functions, stat, X1, I got my five number summary here. I can, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go old school here. 
do a little little screenshot and just paste that in. And then whoop, and there it is. So I'll just kind of chuck that there so that anybody reviewing the notes will be like, ah, where did these numbers come from? Oh, it must have come from a calculator. So we got 53, we got 77.5, uh, 77.5, and actually let me move that comma over. And then 90.5. Poor quality 90, I'm just gonna leave it the way it is. All right, so we have the five number summary. Now the big question is, okay, now that I have that, I'm not gonna leave it alone. I gotta put this out of here. Uh, what do I do with it? Well, it's a box plot, so you gotta imagine that the graph is gonna have some kind of box involved. Uh, there's definitely more to it than that. It's not, the, the, the true name for this graph is the box whisker plot, which is just so idiotic sounding that I decided a long time ago that I'm just never calling it that. So it's a box plot, right? Just like the stem plot is actually the stem and leaf display, not calling it that. So it's a stem plot, right? Uh, dot plot is actually just a dot plot. But to, in order to create a box plot, what we need to do is create a scale that spans from the lowest value to the highest value in even increments, right? So we're scaling our, our, our number line here. So it really is just a number line. It's a glorified number line. I'm starting at zero and I'm going to 100, right? I wanna break up this interval from zero to 100 into even increments. And it's up to you how you wanna designate that. 